Well, good morning, good afternoon. Um, sorry my start's a little choppy, but uh, I need to make sure that this is recording. And my eyeglasses are changing so much that I can barely see long distance with my glasses anymore. So, <laughs> the joys, right? Um, I'm sure I'm not going to get any sympathy from anybody out there. But it ain't easy getting older, is it, gang? Oh, all right. Anyway, I like to have a little fun. Um, well, welcome. I'm really glad that you're a part of this, as I have been sharing each and every Wednesday. I'm excited about the topic for today. And the reason that I'm excited about the topic is because I think that this Bible study, no more than 30 minutes, is going to be helpful in the way that you read the Bible, uh, you read the Gospels, and when we hear disagreements about Bible passages, um, we have the ability to understand that there's different forms of Bible texts. Um, everything in the Bible is not to be read literally. A uh, great example of that would be a Matthew's Gospel about cutting off, chopping off your hand, plucking out your eye. Now, if you know to prevent you from doing something wrong now there may be some people who would read that literally um, but I would say most people today would understand that although it says it in the Bible that's not to be read literally so how do we read it and how do we say that we're not to read that literally so all that to say is that I have provided a document this comes from my seminary years you're gonna see this was scanned in thanks to Norma. It's on a PDF file and I'm going to be really reading from this and making some comments. Um, but this was way back in 2001. Uh, I was doing a little bit of uh, cleaning in my office today and uh, I was going through some binders and looked through my seminary bindles, binders that I saved all the notes and this just popped out at me and I just wanted a little bit of a change in terms of what we're offering. So I thought it would be very helpful to discuss the forms that are found within the Gospels to help you and I read in a much bigger context. Um, so uh, we're going to just jump right into it and uh, we'll see where we end up. Now um, there are two primary different forms and then there are sub forms underneath that but uh, two primary forms of reading the Gospels is understanding that there's narrative material, you'll see this on your document, and then also sayings material. So let's start with narrative, which on your document is number one. Within the narrative material, there is the, the pronouncement story, uh, there's also the legend, there's miracle stories, um, and there are there is the call story. Okay, so we'll be talking about four specific parts within the larger narrative material. And then as you can see in your document, once we get to the sayings material, uh, there's different types of sayings in the Bible. There's legal sayings, eschatological sayings, there's proverbs, there's aphorisms, um, there's parables, um, there's kira, uh, parallelism, anthesis, chiasm, and hyperbole. All right, so that'll be interesting when we get to that part. Um, so that's just a, a broad brush stroke of what we're going to be talking about today. So let's look at the first um, under narrative material, the pronouncement story. As you can see in my handwriting there way back in 2001, it says it's very common within the synoptics, the synoptic gospels. Synoptics is a, is a, is a word for same, similar. Uh, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then John's gospel is standing outside. Um, so uh, there is, um, in the pronouncement story, um, it is a very brief story about Jesus that culminates in a short, striking saying, and possibly an action, and reveals something of his character and faculty in repartee when challenged by others. Both the specific situation described and the response it props normally by Jesus are indispensable to this type of story. Now, in a pronouncement story that follows a certain form, there are certain things that happen in a pronouncement story. As you can see on your document, it says flow. There is a situation. Shouldn't be a surprise. There is a reaction to a situation by a crowd or a group. There is then Jesus' reaction and response. 
uh, possibly noted in in the document by some type of dialogue between Jesus and the crowd or the person. Um, and then there's a conclusion with this universal explanation of a theological point. Um, generally, no one but Jesus is specifically named. Others are groups or representative characters. So these characters are going to represent maybe a certain group of people. But it's really about Jesus, right? So he's the one who's specifically named. And then it's probably circulated independently and was used to highlight a saying of Jesus for a certain point or a situation. Now, what's great about this document is it's going to give us certain examples uh, of what it is that we're talking about. So, uh, as the document lays out, uh, an example of this would be Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 38. And then you can go back and read, you know, in your Bible, this section. But it's going to map out each of the different flow moments. And then when you're reading other gospel stories, you have this document in front of you and you say, okay, is this a narrative material? Is this a narrative, meaning there's a story? If I'm able to uh, say, yes, it is, well, what type of narrative material? Is it a pronouncement story? Is it a legend, right? And it's kind of interesting to, to go through and then try to place the gospel stories within this framework. Now, it won't be successful all the time, but I, I think you'd be surprised at what you're going to be able to develop. Um, in me relearning the piano, I have finally started back again, but going back to the basic structures of learning chords and the scales and all the time that I'm spending down in my basement doing that. And I'm finding the great benefit of now having those things so ingrained that I'm able to then develop to the next step, right? Um, and that's what this is. It, it's knowing what's underneath so that when we get to the gospel text or the music, we're able to play with it much better. So uh, let's jump into the text. There's a situation. Um, on you know one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields as they made their way. His disciples began to pluck the grains, right? So that's that's the context. That's the situation. That's the scene. And then there's a response to the situation. Um, uh, and the situation being the disciples were plucking the grain. So then there's a response. And the Pharisee said to him, Look, uh, why are they doing what is not lawful? Jesus responds. And then he says, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God. And then it goes on. He ate the bread and it's not lawful. And then there's the conclusion, right? This is that universal explanation that Jesus comes in. And this is maybe what we most remember, if we're going to remember Bible passage. We, re we remember the conclusion because we find that, well, that's where the summary of the teaching is. So Jesus comes in in 27 and 28. He says, Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not um, for humankind for the Sabbath. And so the Son of Man is Lord even on the Sabbath, right? Um, so so that, that's one of those, um, you know, there's a pronouncement, meaning that there is a, there's a teaching. And again, I think we're most familiar with the conclusion. But try to, if, if you're having a hard time, try to find the conclusions and then back into the, the other three. Back up to the Jesus' response, the response to the situation, and the situation see how you can do for that okay page two um oh, by the way this required a lot less preparation than my point <laughs> pulling out the document maybe i'll just do seminary i'll just keep opening my binder this will be like a seminary class that we get to participate in but it's nice because i get to share a little bit of myself and my own training uh, my own my own education as well all right next one is a legend so what is a legend? The legends are stories that focus more on the heroes and the heroines of the faith. These individuals are at the story center as an example to be emulated or to be avoided by the reader. So what's the flow on this one? One, a person will do or say something. Two, there's a discussion between Jesus and that person or those opposed to that person. And then three, the statement by Jesus commending or condemning the action or stance 
of a person. Um, now an example of this, again, you can go back later, look at your Bible, how you're going to have this document, keep it in your Bible, and then you can refer to it. But as an example, Luke 10, 38, 42. So the, so the person doing the first part now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. So that's that person doing. Then there's this discussion. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. This is need of, there is only need of one thing. And then you have the commendation uh, by Jesus. So in this one, Mary is actually commended. And maybe by default, Martha is actually um, condemned. But this is an example. So there, she's being commended. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Okay? So that's, uh, that's another flow as well. I'm just going to keep moving through the document because I know a half hour was going to come quickly. Uh, and then at the end, maybe I'll summarize a little bit of, of, of what we're seeing and hearing. So let's jump in to see the miracle stories. Again, what is it? It is... Uh, in its broadest term, this form includes any narrative that contains a description of a miraculous event. So this one should be pretty easy, I think, to identify. I think we might struggle a little bit maybe with the, that number two, the legend, a little bit. Um, trying to make the distinction between that and a pronouncement story. I could see a little bit of hesitation on that, but I, I really can't see us struggling finding uh, C, the miracle stories. The flow, uh, one, there is a statement of a problem, a request for help, person described, not named. Two, there is a solution, often the main point. And three, the proof that the solution worked includes the crowd's reaction to a solution. Usually amazement, as I wrote in my notes there usually, but also there is the... Um, Sometimes there is the negative reaction to a miracle as well. Not often, but it does certainly happen. Let's look at some examples of following types of miracle stories. So it's even subsetted even more. There is the healing miracle. Jesus restores a person to health and community. There is the, there is, is the recitation story, right? Jesus has the power over life and death. Um, giving back someone's life happens in the Gospels. Uh, there is the exorcism. Jesus has the power to bind Satan and liberate those held in Satan's bonds. Um, that's an example in Mark 5. There is the provision story. These ones we like. Jesus perceived and provides for human need. A lot of beautiful provision stories. Um, I love the ones of the feeding of the 5,000. Um, and in addition to more than 5,000, counting women and children, um, providing bread and, and fish, there's enough there. And then there's the rescue story, a lot of rescue stories, thinking about times on the sea, and Jesus is asleep in the boat, right? But uh, he rescues them from the harm of the choppy seas. So again, those I think will be very helpful and uh, easier to identify. Um, they even given a, I guess, another example on top of the examples above. Matthew 8, 1, 4. The statement of the problem, which is the request for help. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And there was a leper who came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. So the solution is, he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I do choose. Be made clean. And then the proof, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Then Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer a gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Very nice. All right. There's days that I wish that I was able to see that immediate proof uh, often. 
Okay. So let's look at then the final one in the narrative material, if I have that right, the call story. Another one that I think should be easier to identify. Uh, what is it? These are stories in which Jesus calls person to follow him as disciples and so participate in God's plan being worked out by and through Jesus. What is the flow? Number one, Jesus happens to be traveling by. Two, Jesus sees the person, often engaged in their vocation. Three, Jesus calls the person to follow. And an important part, very important, it's with an imperative, meaning an exclamation point. It's not a, a, a kind offer, right? It's follow me, exclamation point, not follow me, maybe, please. Um, it's follow me, exclamation. And four, person follows Jesus, often leaving all else behind, which to our modern ears, it's really uh, kind of surprising that that, that would happen. Uh, the stress is on the power of Jesus' call and invitation to discipleship. He is the one in charge. Uh, and then I wrote back in 2001, let me read this, many sermons place emphasis on the person called, uh, which would actually be a legend. So, so the point of this is that the emphasis is actually uh, f um, focused on Jesus' power it's not uh, focused on the person being called. Um, but the call story originates with Jesus and where the power comes. So there's a distinction maybe between the emphasis on Jesus and then it would shift to legend if the emphasis was placed on the person receiving the call. A great example is Mark 1, 16 through 18. Um, as Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, so we have a place, he's traveling by. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Follow me would be exclamation point. And then, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. Um, a little bit of a jump off, but um, Mark's gospel, if you ever just look through a certain translation, but uh, the word immediately should be, in your Bibles, it is a prominent word in Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel is just very fast-paced, very um, urgent, and there's a lot of immediacy, um, which I think it's uh, might be good for us to think about as the church, a sense of immediacy before us. All right, so we're about halfway. That might actually time up pretty well. Um, so that gets us through the narrative material. Now we are on to the saints material, which... I think this part will be most helpful in addressing the situation about literalism in the Bible. That's where we find a lot of the disagreements. What is it that we are to take literally and what is we are not to? Um, now there's people who get very nervous that they'll just say, well, all the Bible's to be read literally, right? Because then there's a fear, well then what are we to listen to? Well. You're not only supposed to listen to things that are literal, but even if it's not literal, there's still a moral. There's still the teaching there. And, um, you know, the Bible isn't one of those things that you pull one thing out and it all crumbles for the fear of people who are literalists. No, you know, you can um, have this understanding and you're not sacrificing the truth of the Bible because it may not be literal or historical. Um, but truth, uh, truth doesn't just come in facts. Uh, truth comes through um, these types of things in which we're going to be talking about. Okay, so don't just just notice uh, people who who start to you know get real um, insistent that there's only one way that you read this Bible and it's just all literal. Well, then you say, okay, if that's the case, then here's a cleaver to chop off your hand and then people are like oh no well, <laughs> oh not that part but everything else all right what is the saints material saints material includes memorable quotations that may have been preserved apart from any particular context types of saints there are legal saints interpreting law in many ways mark 227 then he said to them him being Jesus, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for Sabbath. 
Okay. So of of course there is the leak you know the legal about the Sabbath. Um, you know, honor the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. That's that's a legal commandment item. Uh, Jesus is now interpreting that law in a, in a new way. Remember, because the Pharisees uh, are are critical of of Jesus' disciples working on the Sabbath. Well, Jesus is taking the law and he's interpreting it in a new way, which is based upon the law of love. They are working because they are trying to be helpful to people. So that would be a legal saying. The other really big part is the eschatological sayings. Um, you, as Bible study, Bible study participants, know what the word eschatological means. It's interpreting the future and all its implications in the present. So um, eschatological is not just future gloom and doom, but it's understanding that there is an end that we talked about last week through the Romans passage, a redemption, a cosmic renewal, that's there. So what does it mean to us now? What are the implications of that, of that telos, of that end times for the, for the present? Well, Luke 12, 35, 40 is a good example. Um, and what he's doing is he's talking about, you know, what does it mean? Well, be dressed now for action. Have those lamps lit. Be prepared. Um, and, you know, um, halfway down it says if he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so blessed are those slaves but know this that if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming he would not have left this house to be broken into you also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an unexpected hour so the present implication is be ready now don't just know that there's an end um, a redemptive end but be ready now third one should be familiar to us proverbs you might not have actually known what the definition of a proverb is, but they are wisdom sayings of common sense that are expanded for a theological point. There is, of course, as we know, a book of Proverbs. You may not spend much time opening those, but I would really commend them to you. Uh, they're very interesting, um, very edifying. You know, there are some they may not feel as relevant, um, but I trust that if you read the Proverbs, there's going to be some that you're just going to go, hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very wise. And it's things that you might have already known, but you get to see it written down on the page, which confirms what it is that you've been feeling. An example of a proverb um, um, that comes from Jesus' teaching in Mark's Gospel, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, and the new from the old, and the worst tear is made, and so no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine would burst the skins and the, old, and the wine is lost. And so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wine skins. That sounds like something like a grandparent would teach us or a parent. Just makes perfect sense, right? Why put something new into something old? Um, because the old just can't handle that and then you're gonna lose that new wine. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, aphorisms might not be as familiar to us, uh, but they are brief sayings that are tied more to a specific situation or contained as part of a broader form, such as a pronouncement story or another sayings. Um, these can include a statement inviting the hearer to accept the truth of Jesus' assertion. Uh, example is Matthew 10, a disciple is not above the teacher nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple uh, to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of this household? Another uh, form of an aphorism is a question calling on the hearer to consider what Jesus says. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? And then finally, there is the imperative um, of calling for the hearer to envision or enact what Jesus says. Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not uh, be able. Um, so again, those might be a little bit more difficult to identify, but remember, um, aphorisms or brief sayings tied to a more specific situation or contained as part of a broader form 
of a pronouncement story or a saying. So that, that might get a little confusing because you may try to be tying it back up to the pronouncement stories. Um, but it's there before you to at least ruminate a little about. Do a little bit more digging around in your own way. This is just a way to begin. This is not the end all. But at least gets you thinking when you open the Bible now to try to place that particular passage within this framework. This is, these are not the only frameworks, but they, they represent a majority of the frameworks as well. Next one, uh, you should definitely be able to remember parables, right? Uh, that one is we are much more familiar with. Um, I would provide at least a definition. Um, and, and I'm going to move down to the reference as a symbol, meaning that the parable, a parable is something that points beyond itself to something greater, such as the dynamics of God's reign now uh, being ushered in by and through Jesus. So uh, this past Sunday, um, we're looking at the weeds and the wheat, right? Um, so what Jesus is doing is taking something that is common and then trying to relate that commonality to a larger teaching of what Jesus um, is revealing. Uh, the one that we use here was uh, Mark 4. Again, the kingdom of God is like someone who would scatter seed on the ground. And we had this a few weeks ago in Matthew's gospel. Would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how, but the earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with the sickle because the harvest has come. Um, now again, the one a few weeks ago was about the seed being thrown on the soil, the different paths under the rocky ground. Um, but we're definitely in the season in summer of seeds and weeds and, and growing. Um, so parables, again, are familiar to us, uh, more familiar than the other ones. Um, a kaira uh, is a significant saying by an important person. And in my notes there, I said that Luke has the most of these. Um, there is more emphasis on the actual sayings themselves. So it's a response by an important person. Um, while he was saying this, meaning Jesus, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nurse you. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's, again, that one's going to be a little bit more difficult to identify. There is going to be some crossover with other ones as well. Um, but the situation could also include uh, an, a statement by an unnamed person to an important person. And that's a good example that you have Jesus as the important person and you have the woman as an unimportant person. Um, so that's a form as well. Okay, so we're actually, I hope I didn't skip over a page. I don't think I did. <laughs> but let's move on to, should be on page seven by now. Um, and there are some additional uh, sayings employ particular stylistic features that include um, parallelism, um, anthesis, chiasm, and then hyperbole. Um, so let's dig into those as well. Uh, this is getting in the weeds a little bit, I understand, but I still want to offer to you, and then you can ignore it, or you can take the next steps on yourself. Parallelism has two or more lines that express the same thought in a parallel manner. Uh, Matthew 10, 27, What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. So the parallelism would be in the first dark and light and then quiet and then loud. So parallelism, which is another way to reinforce the teachings when you have these two opposite um, realities, right? It'll, so um, being in the darkness will then raise up the importance of the light. Uh, being quiet or not hearing something, when it's louder and proclaimed, it will be reinforced because we are in the quiet Right, so it's just a way to reinforce whatever that teaching is. Um, Antithesis, yeah, that's a, not a word you say often, but is the second line expresses the opposite of the first line. 
Matthew 7, 17, in the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Um, so it's a sense of opposite, which is, again, somewhat related to parallelism, but a little bit different. Um, chiasm is a reverse parallelism found in the Greek, but often can be missed within the English translations. Example of that is Mark 8. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Um, so uh, that one, again, it, it could be missed because it really depends on the way the Greek is translated into English. To be able to capture that reverse parallelism requires a, a pretty literal and uh, accurate translation. And then finally, hyperbole, this is probably a word that you heard of, but you never really knew what the definition is. It is an intentional exaggeration to get the full attention of the hearers. It doesn't work well for people translating literally. Um, and this, again, began uh, from the very beginning, uh, one of my examples, um, Matthew 5, 29, 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. Um, that is, again, a very intentional exaggeration. And, you know, that's really important to know. So, actually, let me step back a little bit. What's really important to know is that where these things come from doesn't just happen in the Bible, right? So hyperbole is not something that was created so that the Bible could be written. But hyperbole has existed um, since the beginning of writing. Um, these are forms of expression. This comes in the way of art, of perhaps the muses, right? Which is the, the root word for a museum. It, it's, it's where... Um, humanity tries to express the way that they're feeling in writings and in song. So um, these forms are not just found in the Bible, but they're found in all writings, ancient writings, modern writings, and current writings as well. Um, so certainly in, in Greek writing, uh, there is hyperbole, there is parallelism, there is chiasm. It's not only related to the Bible. Now, why this is helpful in knowing these forms is to know, again, the Bible doesn't just kind of plop down, but, but the Bible is created through the stories, is written through the inspired, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? But using the forms that the way that humans write. Um, so all this to say is that a, a hearer and a reader of something like Matthew's Gospel 529 in in the present day of Jesus is speaking and and even a long time afterwards because of the education and, and the thoughtfulness people would know that it's a hyperbole they would never assume that this is a literal command of Jesus we sadly without knowing these forms of knowing the different ways of expression of writings we either look at it as literal or non-literal. And that's not the way that most humanity would ever read this stuff. It's only a maybe a postmodern sort of way of reading things, of this very literalism. And if it's not literal, then it's not true. That's craziness. One of the final things here. One of the great examples that I repeat over and over again is about Jonah, Jonah's story. Um, we know the story, right? That, that Jonah is called and, and uh, you know, to preach and he, he goes away and then he's in the ship and then he's tossed in the sea and then he's swallowed up in the belly of the large fish and then he's vomited up on land and then he preaches and all that sort of stuff. Well, okay. So the question before you today is that, is that a literal story? Is that a historical event? 
I don't know. I, I mean, I wasn't there, right? Um, in my experience, is that something that can happen? No. But I believe in the God who created the cosmos, so could God make this happen? Yes. Um, so there's days in which I believe that it is a literal historical event, and there's days in which I just say it's not. I just can't bear that. But the point is, is it does not take anything away from the story if I know that the story is told for the purpose of the teaching. And the teaching is, whether it's a literal historical event or a non-literal historical event, but the point of it being written is this, is that when God calls you to do something, you do it. And if you don't do it, well, then you're going to end up in the sea, in the belly of fish, vomit up on land, and you're going to end up doing what it was that God wanted you to do anyway. So why don't you just do it the first time, and then you don't have fish vomit all over you? That's, that's the moral. That's the teaching, that when God calls, you follow. And that is not dependent upon the fact of whether it is a literal historical event or not. And, and so um, I'm going to end here because I'm over the 30 minutes. But nonetheless, um, it really gets us thinking about what the Bible is, how to read it, and um, in some ways, how not to read it. And I'm afraid that we have shifted so far in ways of, of not understanding all of this to understand what is before us and the power that comes from it. So I am always open to more discussions about it. You can uh, call me. Send me an email, post something on Facebook if you want to have a follow-up question. But um, this is enjoyable today. I, I'm just going to be inspired and bounce around, and I hope that that's okay with you. So uh, peace and be well, and uh, God bless you.